Right. Hello, everyone, again. Happy Thursday. It's going to our six week lecture. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to continue the lecture on optimization. Let me share the screen with you. I have, I have put the lecture material on iLearn, so you should be able to see the lecture slides and also the Excel files. All right, so this is the first part of the linear programming models. Chapter four. Uh, we're gonna see a different type of problem, which is actually more complex. Um, and it doesn't look like you can actually model it uh, you know, easily at first, um, but you, you're gonna see um, how, how we can actually model this kind of problem. Uh, and it's actually interesting. So, so it's not like very intuitive type of problem that you can find the solution to. Okay. So let's see what it is. It's an investment problem, but it's a regular investment. So it's not um, the, the investment is going to be have different conditions on how much it's gonna return and how many you can invest. In. So that's it. So at the beginning of year one, BJIC has $100,000 to invest over the next four years in five uh, from um, a possible of five investment options a b c d and e which have irregular cash inflows and outflows um, the investment type a requires investment at the start of year one that means that if you want to invest in a you have to start investing at year one okay um, one dollar invested returns 50 pence, 50 cents um, at year two and one dollar at year three. That's like um, one dollar and fifty cents for each dollar invested. Okay. But the return is going to be next coming years. For B is similar to A, but a year after that. That means that um, you invest in year two and you're going to get um, 50, 50 cents in year three and one dollar in year four. C would require investment at the start of year one, and one dollar invested would return one dollar and twenty cents at the start of year two. Investment D requires investment at the start of year four, so you cannot still is investing at four D at year one to three. Okay? And for each dollar investment for D, it's going to return one dollar and ninety cents um, at the start of year five, which is really impressive. And E requires investment at the start of year three, and for each dollar investment in E would return $1.50 at the start of year four. So as you see here, we have a lot of actually different kind of conditions and return um, policy or plan here. Okay. So what do we wanna do? We have 100, we had hundred actually thousand dollars we wanna invest um, the next five years. And this is the, this is the um, conditions for our investment. What we wanna do is we want to maximize our return um, at the end of year five. And there's more condition. Any, any amount can be invested at any of these five investments, but not more than $75,000. Okay? So you cannot invest more than $75,000 in any of these um, five um, stocks or you know, options. Returns are assumed to be the same for every $1 invested. So it's, it's a linear relationship between investment and return. At the beginning of any year, the BGIC can only invest its cash on hand. So you're gonna have cash on hand, you have cash invested, and then at the end, you can get the return from the previous year and the cash, net cash from the previous year, you can invest it, you can actually put it in um, to get actually some um, interest rate annually. So cash not invested in any year can be put in a short-term money market account that would earn 3% annually. Um, and the goal is to maximize the amount of money on hand or the net cash on hand um, in year five. Okay, is the problem clear to you? Does anyone understand the problem? So it's, as you see here is a complicated investment problem. We wanna maximize our investment or cash return um, at the year five. So, Let's just start with the influence chart. We start at the end, the objective or the output, which is the net cash flow in hand 
um, in year five. Okay? So we want to maximize that. What is going to influence that? The beginning of each year cash flow, the cash invested in a given year, and the return from the previous investment. So these are the three factors for uh, the net cash. For the beginning of each year, the cash that you have, it's going to be impacted by the initial amount that you invest, interest rates for the money that you haven't invested, just put in the short term um, to get 3% interest. Um, and also for the cash invested, on, and that's been, um, influenced by how much you, your, your actual investment plan, that's which is going to our decision variables showed by um, the reddish color here. The returns from the investment in prior year would depend on the cash return per dollar invested and also how much, you know, what's the, the plan, your investment plan, which is our decision value. So this is how they these are related. Okay, so from this on, we're going to go to the um, Excel file and we're gonna start formulating the problem. All right, so this is the data, uh, the BGIC investing data. Um, I have put this in Ireland. Um, these are just show the data that we have from the problem. Um, so just a just comment on, on your assignment as well. As you see here, it is a good practice to, um, you know, name the sheets that you're working on. Um, there were a couple of students that they, they didn't name their sheets. Um, so it was difficult. Sheet one, sheet two, you know, they have to go through to which one is the model, which one is the influence chart, which one is the question, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna go with the older formatting, et cetera. Um, the inputs, what do we have? You have an initial amount of investment. You have $100,000 uh, money on hand that you want to invest. The maximum for investment, there's a cap, cap on that and that's $75,000. So you can only invest more than $75,000 on any investment. The interest rate on cash is 3%. Uh, so these are our input. That's why we have used the uh, input style here. Uh, we have an outlay of the requirements or the conditions of when you can actually invest on any of these options. For example, uh, this is the plan, um, the condition plan. So this is the investment for year one to four. Uh, if you want to invest on A, you can only invest on year one. Okay, for B, you can uh, only invest in year two. For C, year one. For D, year four. For E, year three. And the next table shows the return. So the return would also include year five if you didn't have it in the, in the previous table. Okay, so investment on the columns and years on the rows. So for investment A, which means I have to do it in year one, uh, the returns are going to come 50% uh, on in the second year and 100% on the third. For every dollar, that's 50 cents and one dollar. For investment B, which we invest at second year, we're going to have 50% or 50 cents here for each dollar in the uh, third year and 100% on one dollar for each year, for each dollar at the fourth year. Um, for investment C, we have to invest at the year one. And we're gonna have for each dollar, we're gonna have one point twenty dollar return at year two. For investment D, we start gonna we have to invest it on year four, and our return is gonna come at year five. Uh, for each dollar invested, it's gonna return one dollar and ninety cents. For investment option E, we can invest only on year three. And at year four, we're going to get the investment or the return back um, by $1.50 for each dollar invested. Okay? So this is kind of modeling or putting the information that we had from the problem um, into Excel. Okay. Any question here? All right, so these are actually also our inputs. So I'm going to use the formatting styles um, be my inputs here as well. Um, so let's start modeling here. Okay. 
So we know that we, we need the, like a decision plan, the, how, how much we should invest on uh, each options, A, B, C, et cetera, et cetera. So here I'm going to have our um, decision making, the decision variable here. I'm going to call it investment, investment plan. And then uh, align it on the right side. And these five investments, I'm going to be using the decision variable, uh, my decision um, format. Let me just do some number here. One dollar, two dollar, three dollar, one dollar, five dollar. This has to be dollar values. Currency. Right. And we know that for each investment, the total amount invested cannot exceed uh, $75,000. So that means that if, if I put the um, maximum or cap of the investment, and I want to say that, okay, whatever you invest on A, it should be less than $75,000. Okay, so I'm gonna use insert the less than equal to sign here for readability of the model. And I'm going to drag this and copy it to the rest of the five decision variable that we have. And here, I'm just going to let me name this before I move on. So I'm going to name all of these the formulas with um, selection, left column, that's correct. But now I'm going to jump. So the max investment is actually an out input that you already have it, and that's actually $75,000. So I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to copy it to the rest of the five. Um, this is valuable that we can. Okay. And these are also input, but we are not really uh, calculated quantities. So we use the my input as well. It's, it's not really um, different from what we have, it's just equal to that $25,000. Uh, I'm going to um, use the currency here to format it. Okay. So that's another. Um, Inputs that we had. We also had um, some constraints. So the constraints is um, our investment cannot be negative. Um, so, and also we had like cash on hand, we had amount invested, the due return, the net cash, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to have create um, another table here. Okay. So cash balance. And so here I'm going to put the years here, year one, year two, and we have five years, so I'm going to drag this down to copy over five to create all the five years that we have. And so what we have here is we have the beginning cash at each year. We had the returns. We had cash invested. And we had the net cash. All right, so um, year one, the beginning cash that we have is the $100,000 that we have, right? So this is going to be equal to, so I'm gonna reference this cell here. And these are all values going to be cash or currency here. Format it, right? Um, the returns. So the returns is going to depend on our decision uh, or investment plan uh, for year one um, that's going to have return, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the sum product here um, so that it would multiply 
our decision variable of investment of these five options multiplied by the returns that we have here for year one, okay? because this is year one. Okay? So basically one multiplied by this, which is zero, it's going to be zero, but because I want to copy paste it for the, for the rest of the years, that's why I want to make this group. Okay? So it's going to be $1 multiplied by the return for investment um, one, year one, investment a year one, um, whatever is here, which is right now is two, just a random number here, is multiplied by investment for E um, year two, in year one, um, plus uh, this value multiplied by the amount invest, the, the return on investment C uh, in year one. Okay. So this is going to be the sum product of these four, five values, comma, these five values. Okay, so let me actually name this. So you can have brain name for them. So I'm gonna do this again. Um, product, investment plan, and the return. Okay. So we can now drag it down to copy to other um, years as well. Cash invested, this is our investment plan. So cash invested is going to be whatever it is here, but right now it's um, one, it's a random number. It's multiplied by our investment plan here, uh, or investment condition. Uh, this value, whatever it is, multiply by, which is our this value, multiply by this value, here, which is zero. This multiply by this, this multiply by this. Uh, so it's a sum product. So I'm gonna do sum product, our investment plan, and the outlays of our investment. Okay. So what is the net cash? The net cash is the beginning of whatever we had uh, the beginning cash um, plus the returns that we have for year one minus the cash that we invest um, from year one that's going to our net cash so it's going to be beginning cash plus the return minus or subtracted by the cash invested okay. all right and we want to make sure that these values should be positive because we cannot have negative values. So I'm going to insert a symbol here greater than symbol. This is going to be for all four, five years. All right. So for year two, for year two. Um, what we have is the net cash from the previous year, year one, um, that, that's the money that we haven't invested. So it's going to grow by 3%, right? Um, so this is going to be this amount of net cash flow from the previous year, year one, multiplied by one plus 3%. But I'm gonna use the references. So whenever we change these inputs, it's going to automatically apply to our model. Okay? And the returns is going to be the same. So I'm just going to copy these values down, drag them down here. Now I can actually drag this down, copy them to up to year five. It's going to be automatically. Um, and the right hand side for our model here, you cannot have negative investment or negative net cash flow. So I'm going to put zeros here. Doesn't happen. All right. So these are also inputs. I'm gonna use the cell formatting here, the model for my input. And the output is if you remember it's the net cash flow at the um, year five. So this is going to be our output. So I'm gonna use the output style here, my output. And I'm gonna name it. So I'm gonna say year five, year five, year 
five and cash. Let me name these two, you can name here below. Let's go. All right, so we pretty much are done with um, the modeling part. Uh, we have our conditions, we have our decision variables, um, our cap on investments, and our outlay of investments, the return, etc. Everything is here. We can now go to um, solver and put this in a solver, model this in solver. So I'm going to open up this. Um, our output is going to be this cell here. I'm going to pick this, this one, and this is a maximization problem. So I'm going to click on maximization problem. And the decision variables or changing variables are going to be these five values here. So I'm going to select those. And we're going to have two set of constraints here. I'm going to add them. One of them is that these net cash flows must be greater than zero. That. And the next one is these values should be less than equal to the cap investment that we have. We cannot have more than $75,000 invested in any of these investment plans. Um, let, let me actually also name these, use range names for these two columns as well. Um, so we would look neater in our model. So now if I go to back to model, it shows, uh, instead of you know, B13, it shows the net cash greater than the right hand side, the investment should be less than the cap on investment, $75,000 right now. Um, the methane constraint, so we can make sure that this is checked. This is a fix, so we're gonna use a simple XLP here, and we're gonna just click solve. So right now, it's just random numbers, $1, $2, So it says solver found a solution, or constraints are which one of the conditions, I'm gonna keep the solution. Um, so the net cash flow, of our investment, uh, which we want to maximize it uh, at year five is 2,886,282 dollars, $2, and our investment is, as you see here. So it says invest 64,286 on A, which is year one, invest the maximum amount that you can, which is $75,000 on stock B or option B, Invest um, also the maximum amount on stock or option D and E. Um, and also, if if you look at the outlay here, our investment plan or investment outlay uh, on a stock A or option A, investment option A, investment option B, or option uh, C, these two have to be done on year one. So and if, you, and if you actually sum this up, so sum. This was this value. It's hundred thousand dollars. Okay, these two. This means that um, the optimal solution um, recommend us to invest all of the hundred thousand dollar in in year one. Okay. Um, and this is going to be how much we're going to be investing. This is going to be how much we're going to have by the end of year. Any question? I have a question. Um, what do you mean, or how did you find the part where you said that it recommends 100,000 in year one? Oh yeah, okay. So uh, if you look at our investment plan, investment decision, this is this is actually um, the optimal values, optimal solution, okay? So it's uh, under A, uh, it says $64,000 invest, $64,000 or $286 invest them on, on A. And thirty-five thousand seven hundred fourteen dollar investment on, on C. But if you look at the outlay here, you see um, for investment A and investment C, you can only invest on year one. Okay, and if you add these two values, um, 
this value and this value, which are invest the amount you invest on A and C, that's hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so it says that on year one, invest the whole hundred thousand dollars on A and C, sixty four thousand on A and thirty five thousand seven hundred something on C. So invest all of the money. Do not leave anything on, on the three percent. Um, that, that's that's what I meant. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. And then, had it not added up to the hundred thousand, would there have been an additional step to calculate or take into account the three percent that the leftover money would have made? And uh, no, no. So if if it had, uh, if you know the summation of these two value wasn't hundred thousand, it would it would imply that okay, in, in, instead of investing the whole money in the first year, hold on to it for the other investments in um, you know, the, the coming years. Um, so that means that the 3% worth something. Right? Um, you, you could actually just put the money in the short-term investment with the 3% interest rate. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, so I have a question. When you, when you invest $100,000 or what value $64,000 on stock A, um, in the second year, you're gonna actually get uh, 50, 50 cents back, okay? Um, so for each dollar invested, that means like about half of it. So if you invest $64,000, 64, $64, um, you're gonna get half of it in the second year and 100% of it on, on the third year. So that's what I'm trying to You have invested $100,000, but in year three, you have hundred thousand dollars plus the fifty thousand dollars. All right. So let me go back to next slide. All right, trace the sequence of optimal investment, the 100K in initial investment. Uh, this is what I mentioned here. Um, the optimal solution recommend us to invest $100,000 in the first year, 64,000 something on it from, for investment on investment A and 30, the rest of it on investment C. Um, and uh, this investment is gonna return 32,000, which is 50% uh, in year two and 64,000 something in year three, which is, 150% of our investment. So we're gonna get 150% back. Uh, and for investment C, we're gonna get 42,000 uh, something, which is, I think, 1.2, 1.2. So it's like 120%. All right, um, sensitivity analysis. So um, there was a cap on our investment. We had initial amount of money of $100,000 and we were bound to uh, not investing more than $75,000 on any of these investment options, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, so now we wanna do a sensitivity analysis on this value. What if um, it was a different value? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna actually um, do um, analysis, sensitive analysis on this value from ranging from 75,000 to up to $225,000 in an increment of 25,000. And wanna see, okay, how would that impact our optimal solution and also which is our investment plan and also our um, output or return at year five. So let's do that. All right, so we're gonna go to solver table. Okay, I'm not, not showing the screen. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go to the solver table here. It says, do you have action, act, uh, um, active sheet? Yes, we do. This is the one-way table, one-way table, okay. 
in the dialog box open here what is the input cell so the input cell here is the max or cap on investment max invested and the range we want to have it from 75 thousand to 225,000 by an increment of 25,000. And our output, we want to see how would that impact um, our investment plan and also our net cash on hand in year, um, in year five. Let me sure these are selected. Okay, now it's set. All right. So let's see. There is just one sheet here. When I click OK, it's going to run this model a couple of times and it's going to show us the optimal solution and also um, the optimal objective function, which is our uh, uh, maximum amount of uh, return on um, year five for different cap on investment from 75,000 up to 225,000 by an increment of 25,000. If you have a Mac, it's gonna ask you to click on OK to run one of the apps. Okay, so we're gonna get this sheet here. Um, and this is going to be our table, our sensitive analysis table. So you, you see actually the max cap on investment on the first column. So it shows the range is from 75,000 up to 225,000. An increment of 25,000, and you see the investment A to A, B, C, D, E. Instead, it, it doesn't use the original name, just shows investment one, investment two, but it's actually investment A, B, C, D, E, and A. Um, um, e and E. And the last me, one is actually, yes. I'm really sorry to ask this, but uh, do you mind doing the solver table one more time? Uh, you can finish, fin finish up right here, but after, do you mind doing it one more time? Yeah, sure. Okay, so, so these are the four investment, the five investment that they have, and the the, cha the, the changes for each of these uh, runs. Okay, so it's gonna it's gonna run. This is the the, the first problem uh, that they have. Okay, so it's this is seventy five thousand dollar cap on investment, and this is the amount of investment on A, on B, on C, on D, on E, and this is uh, how much cash we're gonna have at year five. Okay. So it's going to run another problem, but instead of 75,000 cap on investment, this time with 100,000 um, cap on investment, and this is going to our optimal um, optimal uh, investment plan, which is going to be $61,000 something on investment A, $76,000 on investment B, C, D. So, um, and this is going to be our um, cash in hand in year five. Um, and another run, uh, but an increment of 25,000. So the cap now is 125,000. And this is our optimal investment plan. And this is our return or cash in planning. Okay? And you can see also uh, there is a graph here for any of these investment plan, investment A, B, C, D, E, and also the net cash flow. I'm going to use the net cash flow here. So um, in this graph, you see here, on the x-axis, it shows the range of the investment cap or uh, from 75,000 up to 225,000. And on the y-axis, it showed the um, cash in hand, net cash in hand in year five, which is our objective function. Um, and, and as you see, almost this is a linear relationship. So it's linearly going to increase based on our investment cap. Right? So I uh, wanted to me to show you how to run it around this um, using the solver table. So I'm going to go to the solver table um, tab here and use the run solver table. It's going to give you, ask you whether you have a um, actually active sheet. That means that first you need to actually run this model on solver. Okay. So you need, you need to get the first objective um, optimal solution, which we already did, right? This is our uh, optimal objective function or the net cash on hand in year five, and this is our optimal investment plan for, for the investment A to um, E. Um, do we have an active one? Yes, we do. Click OK, and here the another dialog box open. Um, to be on a one-way table, yes. And you're gonna get this one. So the input cell is the cell that you want to change it. Um, what is the input? It's going to be an input value. It can be computation, that's the input, okay? So we wanna 
run a sense three analysis on this value. Um, you want to change the $75,000 um, in a range of 75 up to 225,000 by incremental 25,000. Okay, so I'm going to name it max invested. Uh, the minimum value is 75,000, the maximum value is 225,000, and incremental 25,000. You can, you can put any other value that you want. You can actually decrease this to you know, 50,000 and go up to 150, whatever value you want. Yeah, so this is up to you and based on your what if analysis scenario. And here, um, you're going to actually put your output. Okay? So you want to you wanna see these changes and its impact on these outputs. Okay? So the output that I want to see the, see the changes on are the optimal solution or optimal investment plan. I'm going to hold the control key down and then I'm going to click on this output cell as well. So as you see here, it's going to put a comma here and it's going to put um, the output cell here as well. If you click it, let me actually run this for 50,000 um, up to 150. Thousand by an increment of twenty-five thousand. So it's gonna run it again and create this stable for us. Yeah. So this is the max invested from fifty thousand up to one hundred and fifty thousand. This is the amount of investment, or this is going to be our optimum. Um, our optimal um, uh, investment plan for. Yeah, investment A, investment B, C, D, E, and this is going to be our objective function, which is net cash on hand on year five. Um, so, and you can here you can actually it's easier to use a, a graph instead of just these numbers. So again, you see that there's going to be a linear incremental relationship or positive relationship between the cap on investment for each uh, option and also the objective function, which is the net cash on hand um, at year five. Did that help? Yes, thank you, Professor. All right. Let's see what else we have. All right, so we actually are done with the fourth part of the linear programming model. I'm going to close this. The next part of lecture. All right, so we're going to go to actually chapter chapter four is done. We're going to go to chapter five. So chapter five, we're going to learn different types of um, models. It's going to be network optimization. Network models, part one. So the overview of chapter five, uh, part one introduction, we're gonna see uh, an example of transportation problem, uh, three by three, uh, three sources, three um, destinations, and also the tabular formulation for the problem. The part two, we're gonna see another transportation problem. This formulation we're gonna see it, uh, next week. And also on a type of assignment problem, this is another um, type of network optimization problem. Uh, part three, we're gonna see a uh, red brand core transition problem. And for part four, we're, last, we're gonna see a shortest pass problem. So the shortest pass problem is going to be a very popular type of trans network optimization problem that you, every one of us use it every day. So the, the Google map that you use to find the fastest route from a, um, you know, any, point, any point from a point A to point B, is actually running an optimization algorithm uh, a network optimization algorithm to find actually the optimal route from A to B. All right, introduction. Many practical problems can be represented as a graphical network. So a graphical network uh, includes um, some ovals or circles called nodes and some uh, lines called arcs or arrows. Right? So it's going to be directional, um, bi-directional, one-directional, non-directional. Okay. So here in this problem, we have three, uh, three actually origin and three destinations. So we have three cities, Denver, Evansville, Fort Lauderdale in, in Florida. We have Atlanta in Georgia, Boston, and Cleveland. Okay, so the, the three 
uh, red circle all was on the right side are our destination cities and the three um, bluish um, oval cities on the left are our origin cities, okay? Um, the numbers that you see on the left side of um, these, these values that you see, these are actually the capacities of these cities. Um, so that means that you can um, transship or send um, a maximum of 250 from Denver, okay? Um, from Evansville, 300, from Fort Lauderdale is 225. Um, for destination, you also see on the right side of these cities, the red cities of Santa Barbara, and for them, you see also three numbers here. So these are the demand, or um, we're going to call it demand. So we need, for example, 175 of whatever, whatever it is um, for Atlanta to 325 in Boston and 200 units in Korea. And also, you see actually um, three by three. Uh, that's nine. You're gonna see nine arcs or nine arrows from the original cities to the destination cities. For example, from Denver, it's gonna go to Atlanta, to Boston, and to Cleveland. From Evansville, it's gonna go to Atlanta, Boston, and Cleveland. From Fort Lauderdale, it's gonna go to Atlanta, Boston, Boston, and Cleveland. And you're gonna see a, a numbers on these arrows. The numbers show actually the cost um, of sending whatever you want from a unit of whatever it is that you're gonna send it from Denver to uh, destination. For example, um, each unit of, the cost of sending each unit from Denver to Atlanta is gonna be $14, for example, okay? And um, from Denver to Boston is $20. Okay? Um, all right, and the decision is how much to send from each of these cities to each of these uh, destination cities so that you actually meet these requirements or, demand, or demands at the minimum total cost. So you want to minimize the total cost of uh, this transshipment um, or transportation problem, um, meeting uh, or satisfying this demand at the minimum cost, right? Is the problem clear? Anyone has a problem about the, the um, transportation problem here? All right, so this was just an example of an application of network optimization on, on um, transportation problem, but there are actually different uh, interpretation or different application of these types of problem. So many situations fit into this framework, not just those where product is shipped directly from supplier to destination. Uh, for example, when all capacity and demands are one, the network represents an assignment problem against, for example, assignment problems. Uh, for example, you have, um, you have say four uh, operator and you have four machines and you want to assign these operators to the machines. So what is the best um, assignment plan, for example? Uh, transshipment points, nodes. Um, between sources, you can actually have transshipments, middle nodes between sources and destination that can be inserted into the network. So you're gonna actually, instead of like nine nodes, you can actually have um, origin and destination. You can actually have mid, mid, mid uh, in, in between nodes, um, transshipment points. That's going to make your network bigger, larger, and also more difficult to solve, but also it's going to have different application. Okay? So uh, the midpoints or transshipment points between sources and destination can be inserted into the network to allow for intermediate stops or storage locations. Nodes may represent points in items or as well as location. For example, for, to find the shortest path. So this is an example of the, the one that uh, Google Maps uses or any other application that finds um, the, the shortest path between two points uh, because um, in shortest path problem, from any origin to this destination, there's going to be mid cities or mid, mid whatever points. There are a couple of them, hundreds of them. And, and then there are different actually arcs or roads from, or highways say between these. So for example, if you wanna come from San Jose to San Francisco, you, you have a lot of option from you know, roads to go to which city, what part of the city and which road to use. Generally, you're gonna go use the highway. But um, again, depending on the traffic, a lot of other uh, conditions, um, 
you know, uh, it's not an intuitive actually decision to make. Okay, so that's why you use Google Map to give you and find you the optimal, and the fastest or the shortest actually. Which we, these two are not the same. The shortest path is not the fastest path, and okay, because of the traffic and the time that it takes. Um, find the shortest path, the fastest path to a road network. Find the longest, the critical path uh, to a pro network project. So, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, project management, you can also model the project management as the network optimization problem. And instead of a shortest path. Uh, which we have in the shortest pass or Google map problem, we actually are looking for the longest pass in a project management because the longest pass actually is the, the, the pass that is um, um, going to dictate your um, project length. And um, so you want, to, you want to actually know how you can get the project done or where you should focus on um, what activities you have to focus on. Um, so you want um, delay the project, for example, or do it on time. Okay, so in the project management, you're looking for the longest paths. Uh, or it could, it could be a flight kind of problem. The connect flights in an airline schedule into routes from to minimize the cost or maximize aircraft maintenance opportunities. So there are different, many different types of problems that you can actually model many network optimization problems. So these are the geographical location of the uh, transportation problem. This is very simple transportation problem that we have. We have three origins, Denver, uh, Evansville, and Fort Lauderdale, and the three destinations in Atlanta, Georgia, Cleveland, Ohio, and Boston, Massachusetts. And um, all right, so let's actually solve a transportation problem. All right, so, um, all right. So we have this uh, data for the problem. Um, this is um, the transportation cost matrix or table. Um, the destinations are listed on columns. So you see, for example, Atlanta, the three cities, Atlanta, Boston, and Cleveland. And on the sources, you see Denver, Evansville, and Fort Lauderdale. Um, so for example, $14, it's gonna cost you $14 to send one unit of whatever it is from Atlanta to Denver. Right? It's gonna cost you $20 to send one unit of whatever it is from, um, I'm sorry, from, from Denver to Atlanta. Uh, $14 from Denver to Atlanta, $20 from Denver to Boston, or for example, $15 from Fort Lauderdale to Boston. If you look at this table, you're gonna see that, okay, we have actually two minimum values, three minimum values. We have $4, which is from Evansville to Atlanta. We have five, which is from Evansville to Cleveland. And we have six, which is from Fort Lauderdale to Atlanta, right? But so you might be wondering, okay, this is the best thing to do. Um, you, you send um, from Evansville, you focus on Evansville to Atlanta um, and Evansville from, to Cleveland and also Fort Lauderdale to Atlanta. Atlanta. Uh, but this is not going to be an intuitive um, problem. So your, your, the optimal solution that we're going to get, it's not going to be this way. So this is not an intuitive problem. Um, all right, so the total cost, um, we're going to use the sum product here because of the, the cost that we have. For, we're going to have actually another table like this, um, which is going to list the destination on the column and rows in the um, as a source, uh, and that's going to tell us how much you're going to send from each source to each destination. That's going to our decision variables. To find the cost, then you're going to find use the sum product to multiply each um, cell from the decision variable table to this table cost, and then add them up. Okay, as you're going to see in a second um, in Excel. Um, so our constraint is the total sent from each source uh, should not exceed its capacity because each source has a capa capacity, if you remember. And also we want to um, satisfy the demand in the destination. So the total received by each destination must be greater than or equal to uh, its demand. Okay? Uh, the key fact here is if all capacities and demands are integers, this is an important actually theorem in um, optimization that's going to make our lot so much easier because 
solving an integer problem. So this is an integer problem, integer linear programming problem, because uh, you cannot send, for example, if you want to send whatever the, the, the uh, unit is, for example, you want to send, say, bicycles or toilet paper or whatever, you cannot send, um, uh, you know, it has to send the whole unit. You cannot send, say, one and a half byte, right? So it, it is an integer programming problem. But if, if the numbers here, the, the transportation cost here are whole numbers, that means 14, not 14.5, 14.2. If they are whole numbers, then you can actually um, relax the integrality constraints on the decision variable. That means that you can model this as a linear programming instead of an integer linear programming problem. All right, so let's go ahead and model this problem in Excel. All right, so this Right. So this is the data uh, table that they have, the transportation costs. Um, I have used all the formatting convention, etc. I have all the cells here. Okay. And I have used a, a name for the sheet here. It's called model. Here's the problem, small transportation model. So our inputs. Okay, so I have listed in the table, this is called transportation cost table uh, or matrix. Uh, on the column, you see the destinations. Um, there's also a convention for that. You usually put the destination on column and uh, sources in the uh, rows. So we have the three cities on the destination column, Atlanta, Boston, and Portland. And then we have these three city sources on the rows, Denver, Evansville, and Fort Lauderdale. And then they have the transportation cost for these transportation. For example, it's going to cost $14. Uh, to transport from Denver to Atlanta, um, $11 from Evansville to Boston, etc. Okay. Um, so another table that we need is our decision variable. I'm going to put it here. I'm going to call it the shipping plan and constraint. Hold this and put the sources here. So here I'm gonna put the same on the series here. So this is the destination. And these nine cells are going to be our decision value. So I'm going to use my decision is in the center, and these are going to be general values. Okay. So what else? We have to find the um, the total send from, for example, a source should not exceed its capacity. There was also a condition on demand uh, such that for each uh, destination, there was a demand. 
and they want to meet or satisfy the demand. So um, I'm going to put here uh, the total received for the total received. The total received is going to be an amount calculated, which is going to be the summation of whatever we sent from Denver, Evansville, and Fort Lauderdale to Atlanta. So right now, zero. Okay. Don't send anything here. You can put just random numbers here to get different values. And these are just for to random. And I can drag this down here. So now I have um, the summation of these three is going to be um, the amount to receive from in, in Boston. The total amount of receive in Korea. Okay, so we're going to have the same in, in column. So it's going to be the total shift. Okay, so the total shift from each uh, origin or um, each source. So this is going to be the summation of whatever is shipped from Denver to Atlanta, Boston, and Cleveland. Um, I'm going to drag it and then make it center. So this is the total ship. This is going to be our constraint. We, we want to the total ship from each source or each origin to be less than its capacity. Okay? Do not exceed its capacity. So I'm going to insert a value here. Then I'm going to copy it down here. And here I'm going to put the capacity. capacity. Okay, so for Denver, it was 250. Uh, for Evansville, it was 300. And 225 for. For another day, these are going to be our inputs. So I'm going to use the input style here. Um, and also the total received for each destination, we want it to be needed to um, satisfy the demand here. So uh, I'm going to put insert actually a symbol here, um, greater than symbol, and copy for each. Each destination in the center, and this should be greater than the demand. And the demand for Atlanta was um, 175. Uh, for Boston, it was 325. For Cleveland, it was. So these are again inputs. Um, there we go, we have everything. Um, and what else do we need? So we have our cost, we have our decision table, we have our constraints on capacity, we have the constraint on demand. Let me go ahead and actually name these capacity and total shift for the constraints. No, I want to name this demand. We need to also name these, um, these two tables, but because it's a table, you cannot put really on the left side or above it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select this table and I'm gonna go to this cell and you can actually name it here. So I'm gonna say, um, transportation cost. And I'm going to also do the same for other decision variables. So I'm going to select all these decision variables, sell the table, I'm going to call this um, transportation amount. Okay. Now everything has arranged names. If you go to the name range, you're going to see that. Okay, so what else we need? Um, we had our transportation cost, our transportation plan or um, amount. 
we have our capacity, the, the constraint on capacity, the constraints on demand, uh, we need objective function. So objective function, um, the total cost, total cost, total transportation cost. The total transportation cost is going to be um, some product of um, our transportation cost matrix, comma, our transportation amount to transportation plan matrix. Copy, and I'm gonna use uh, the output style for this. And this is going to be currency. I'm gonna format it. All right, so everything is ready for us now to uh, model this in solver. So let's go to the data tab, solver. And I'm gonna go to set the objective function as a total transportation cost here. We are minimizing, not maximizing. So I'm gonna click on the minimization problem here. Uh, our decision variables are this matrix, the pink matrix here. Um, and as you see here, it didn't appear here the range name that we used for uh, the decision variable, but it's gonna appear there after I add the constraints. So the constraint, you have two set of constraints. You have the total shift. This must be less than or equal to the capacity for each source. I'm gonna add that one. So it must be number. And also the total we see must be greater than equal to 39. Okay. Right. So you see that um, for some reason, Speak to this one, demand. Oh, yeah, I haven't named this one. Yeah. No, it's All right. So we are minimizing. Um, we have to name also the transfer to cell as well. All right, so we are minimizing the total transportation cost um, by changing the transportation amount of transportation plan. The constraints are two set of constraints. We want the total received at each destination to be greater than the demand or equal to. And we don't want any of the, at any of the sources of our shipment to be exceed its capacity. Okay. Uh, so now negatively constraint checked, this is, a simple XLP problem. Uh, remember that I, I said that this is actually an integer linear programming problem. Um, you cannot ship, say, one and a half byte from each city, you know, it's, it's one city to another. Um, but because our transportation cost matrix are all whole numbers, we can, there is actually a term that we can actually model this as a linear program. So that constraints for each um, And it's going to be a simpler problem. Uh, so we can solve it using simplex LP. And I'm gonna click solve here. And the message says solver found a solution. All constraints and uh, optimal conditions are satisfied. Okay, so because I modeled this as an LP and not an uh, integer linear programming, you see uh, on, on the right side, you see actually we have access or luxury of having access to the sensitivity analysis table. I'm going to click on that to generate to that too. All right, so this is what the problem tell us our optimal transportation plan should be. It says that do not ship anything from Denver to Atlanta or Denver to Boston. Should uh, send 175, which is the um, uh, from Denver to Cleveland. Do not send anything from Evansville to Atlanta um, or from Fort Lauderdale to Cleveland. Okay, so the total ship here uh, for from the Evansville to Fort and Fort Lauderdale 
um, are exactly equal to our capacity. That means they're maxed out, okay? And our demands are exactly uh, met. They are not exceeded, they are met. And our total cost of transportation is $7,225. Any other transportation plan that you come up with or you try that, um, you know, have these constraints, that means that the total shift of e from each sources do not, do not exceed its capacity and the demands of each resource uh, destination are met, is going to be worse than this. That means that your total cost is going to be higher than. So this is the best, the minimum um, optimal transportation plan that we can come up with. Okay. So let's go to the sensitivity report. Uh, you're going to see two tables here, the variable tables and the constraint table. So we're going to have, we can look here, we have actually nine decision variables, um, three by three. So there are nine, that's why you see actually nine uh, cells here. Um, so you see Denver to Atlanta, this is the decision variable, Denver to Boston, et cetera. So that the next column should define the value. Uh, you're not shipping anything from Denver to Atlanta or from Denver to Boston, that's why it's zero for this solution. We're going to see a reduced cost here, um, the, the object coefficient, the allowable increase, and the allowable decrease. So, what does the reduced cost mean? Uh, it means that if you look here for, um, for the variables that are not um, in the optimal solution, that means that for the variables, decision variables who have zero values in the optimality, okay, that means that they are too costly to be considered in our transportation plan. Right? Uh, the reduced cost shows how much the cost of transportation for that transshipment should be reduced so that it would become a part of our optimal solution. Okay, So for, for Denver to Atlanta, the coefficient or the cost is $14. Okay? That means that any shipment from Denver to Atlanta is going to cost $14. Um, right now, it's not in our optimal solution. That means that you, the um, optimal solution does not recommend to ship anything from Denver to Atlanta. But it says that if you uh, decrease the cost of transportation with any mean um, from 14 to 10, 14 minus 4, uh, 14 minus the um, reduced cost, okay? 14 minus 4, it means that if the cost was could be 10, then uh, the Denver to Atlanta. Uh, shipment could become part of the optimal solution. Okay. Um, the allowable decrease and increase. This shows how much you will, how much you will actually increase or decrease the coefficient, which is the transportation cost. Is a cost, um, and your optimal solution would not change. Okay. So this means that right now, if you if you decrease it by one, two, three, um, four, it's not going to change your optimal solution. But if you increase it, if you decrease it more than four, I think five, it's going to decrease. Your, it's going to change your optimal solution. If you increase your uh, cost, I think that if 14 becomes 15, 20, 200,000, whatever, uh, infinity goes to infinity, your optimal solution has not changed. That means that you, um, the Denver to Atlanta does not. Uh, is not going to include in our optimal transportation plan. Uh, so that's, I'm going to skip over all other interpretation for this. It's going to be what I said here, um, except for example, for here, Denver to Cleveland, the value, the optimal value is 175. So that means that the optimal solution recommends us to ship uh, 175 units um, from Denver to Cleveland. So that's why the reduced cost is zero. That means that, okay, it's already in the opt optimal plan. I mean, you don't have to reduce the cost of transportation to be included in the optimal solution. So let's go to the constraints. So the constraints are based on the demand to be satisfied and the capacities to not be exceeded, okay? So we have the total received and total uh, total received at Atlanta, total received at Boston, total received at Cleveland. These are our uh, demand constraints. The final values of 175, 325, and 200. The right hand side are 175, 325, and 200. So they are exactly met. They are um, the, the demands are um, are met. Okay. Um, 
What does the shadow price say for this? For this, the shadow price says that if you increase the demand for each of these constraints, how much that's going to cost you? So for example, right now it says 10 for total received at Atlanta. Um, the, the, the constraint right now is 175. The demand is 175. This says that if you increase the demand from 175 by one unit, okay, that means 176. If the demand was 176, uh, the total cost would increase by $10, okay? So the optimal cost right now, the optimal total cost is 7,225. Um, it says that instead of this 175 demand, if it was 176, this um, total transportation cost would, would, would increase by $10. Same goes for the shadow price for the total receipt at Boston. Um, so right now it's 325 at the total cost of $700,225. So this says that if instead of $325 demand at Boston, if it was 326, one unit increase, then your total transportation cost, your optimal transportation cost would increase by $19. So these are the three constraints for uh, the demand constraints, these three constraints, greater than, greater than, greater than, which is actually they are equal. That the demands are exactly if not exit. The next three constraints are the total shipment, um, shipment spent, um, which are the capacity constraints. So for example, the total shipped from Denver is right now 175. It should be, it, it is less than the 250 with its capacity. So we have some slack, right? So it's not, it's, it's not at full capacity. It's not used at full capacity. For Evansville, it's 300, which is exactly 300. So it's used up, the capacity is used up. And for the other daily, it's also used up. Okay. Uh, this is interesting. Um, so these, you see for the first one, the, the shadow price is zero uh, because it's already, you have a slack. It's not at full capacity, okay? But for Evans Vinland and Fort Lauderdale, um, because you are at maximum capacity, um, this means that if your capacity actually increases by one, so if it's instead of 300, if instead of 300 for capacity of Evansville, if it's worth 301, one unit, then your optimization, your total cost of transportation would be reduced by $8, okay? So that's why it's negative, okay? Um, same goes for the Fort Lauderdale, okay? So it says that if instead of 225 capacity, which is right now, if you increase this by one, that means that if the capacity of Fort Lauderdale was 226, your total cost would decrease by four dollars. All right, so that's our uh, sensitivity analysis here. Um, we're gonna do another sensitivity analysis after our break. So right now we're gonna take a break um, and then after 15 minutes, we're gonna come back. All right, so let's continue our lecture and go back here. Okay, so we wanna do some sensitivity analysis here. Um, for example, we wanna do a one-way table. We wanna see the impact of changes in say um, the demand um, for, for these three cities and on, on our we're not gonna go to the optimal transportation plan, but on, on the total cost, okay? So we wanna see, um, do a, a one-way table analysis on the changes in these three values of the demand and on the impact that it has on the total cost. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy these three. I'm gonna put them here. I'm gonna call this original demand. And I'm gonna um, have another value here, percent change. 
and that's going to be for the transportation demand um, at, at each destination. So for example, I want to make this um, a cell here, say 10%, right? 10%, sorry. And I'm going to um, calculate the demand based on this percent change and our original demand okay, to, to make all these changes. For example, I want this demand to be, let me name this. So this, this one is, is going to be 175 multiplied by one plus this value here. So this could be negative, positive, or another one. Now I can drag it down, drag it um, to the right to compute the new demand, okay? So now we're changing this value, say 10%, I can come up with, um, different values here, okay? So what I did, I made these three demand for these three destination cities, um, a function of um, the percent change and the original demand. So now we can do sensitivity analysis or one way to um, So let's go to the solver first. I wanna, I wanna see the problem in this one. This is greater than the demand. Let's see where the demand is. So the demand, I'm gonna to go to the formula to see the name changes. I want to make sure that because I copy and paste this original demand here, I wanna make sure that the demand that is in the model is this um, C17 up to C um, E17. Okay, so the demand is C17 up to E17. So it didn't move from this row, the city is here. It didn't move to this row. It's, it's fine. Um, now we go to the solver ta table. We're gonna run a solver table and you have an active solver table. Um, we do that we just solve it. One way table, click okay. It's gonna have another window here open. So what we wanna do, we wanna see the impact of changes um, in this value, which is going to change also these values. Um, and I'm gonna call it percent change percent change um, minimum value we can go from negative 10 percent to say negative 20 percent positive 20 percent 20 positive 0.2 by say four to five. Oh, 25, 20 five. Okay. Um, the output cell, you want to see the impact on the transportation, total transportation. So, what this is going to do. It's gonna change the demand um, from negative 20% of these original values up to 20% of these original values. So it's gonna compute, um, uh, and it's gonna compute, we run the optimization, find the optimal plan and optimal objective function, and it's gonna see the impact of those changes on the total cost. It's gonna create um, a, another sheet here. So this is the report here. So on the first one, we have the percent changes from negative 20% to 20%, one increment of 5%, and we have just one um, output, that's the transportation cost. Um, and you see also um, this graph here. You could also do it on the, let, let's go back and do it actually on. So I'm gonna run the solid below. Okay, so everything stays the same, except that I'm going to also include this 
hold on the control key and I select the output the object to find it. So I want to see the change is also an optimal transportation plan as well. Click OK, it's going to compute here. Okay. So you see um, the changes in demand by percentage from a range of negative 20% up to 20% of the original demand. And uh, these are going to be our optimal transportation. Um, for example, this is going to be from Denver to Atlanta, Denver to Boston, Denver to Cleveland, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is going to be the last one is going to be the total transportation as the objective plan. Okay, so we can also see the changes by graph. So I'm going to use the last graph, which is the last one, to the optimal transportation cost. So let's see what happens. Um, as the demand increases um, from 20, negative 20%, which is going to be, say, 175, negative 20%. So about 140 for Atlanta. Um, our total cost is going to increase. And at some point, although in the graph it shows that it's going to go to zero, but if you look at the um, problem here, it says not feasible. Okay, so that means that if you increase your demand because your capacity is limited, um, at some point your capacity is not enough and sufficient to meet the demand. It doesn't mean that it's uh, so the, the graph can be actually misleading. It doesn't mean that the total cost is zero. You have to look here. Um, Problem can become infeasible because you don't have enough resources to meet the demand. But generally, you said you can see up to this point that it wasn't infeasible. You still had enough capacity to meet the demand, satisfy the demand. The total cost is increasing as your demand increases. Okay, so you can do the same analysis for the capacity to see how's that going to um, change. Let's actually do that. Um, I'm going to do, do it here. Um, say, percent change capacity. And I'm gonna put it 10 percent say to and and I'm going to copy these here. I'm going to make these calculated values. So this is going to be this multiplied by one plus this value. I'm going to drag this down. And now we can run the solver table again, this time for the capacity. So I wanna see the changes on this input. Um, the percent, percent change capacity, and it's gonna go from negative 20% to 20% by increment of 5%, and I want to see uh, the impact on um, the decision variable and optimal total cost. So I'm going to click OK. I'm just going to do this one. Um, so this time, when you decrease the uh, supply of the capacities, you see the first four, five, four, the first five um, scenarios is going to be infeasible. Okay. Um, but you see the changes that it's going to have on each. Uh, decision variable. The, for example, this one is going to be um, the transshipment amount from Denver to Atlanta, um, Denver to Boston, Denver to Cleveland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And last one is the
So this four, five, this five one, um, which shows zero, it's not really zero. It will not cost not zero because the, the problem comes from the visible. Right? That's why um, this the Excel graph doesn't understand invisibility. What does this mean? So it's gonna replace it with zero. Okay. So it's gonna you have to start interpreting from this uh, this point right here. Um, so your total cost is going to decrease gradually and linearly by increasing your, your um, capacity, right? By increasing capacity from zero to 20%, um, your total cost is going to be. That's what's so interesting um, insight. All right, so that was it. Let me see what else we have here. All right, so we, we did all the, um, all the, what we wanted to cover. And so we talked about the reduced cost. We, we talked about the shadow prices. Um, we did analysis on the one-way table for on demand. And also we did it on the supply and we um, did uh, learn about the invisibility um, as well. All right. Okay, so that's that's actually it. that's the what will be had the lecture for today. Um, so from now on, from um, today, uh, you can if you have a question or you want to talk about your assignment, um, you can do that. Um, otherwise, you are welcome to leave the class. And you have a great day. Thank you so much, Professor. I was wondering Thank if we you. would be getting assignment four assigned to us soon. Yes, I'm going to upload the next assignment tomorrow. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, sure. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. Have a good Bye, night. Sir.